you. Hi, great to be here. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a theory of everything. And uh, it kind of starts, I think all of you remember the Cold War. Uh, probably had nuclear nightmares like everyone, and this is kind of the thing that was for the whole generation. But uh, in Iceland, it was quite good because this brought like $200 million of re revenue into a military base that we had because Iceland was stationed very strategically between the superpowers that were going to throw bombs at each other. But then the Cold War was over, and uh, the Americans said, now we're going to close down the base. But that was a problem because 2,000 people were working in the base. And uh, in the news, you would see that it was regarded unethical to close down the base. But then the Americans said, who's your enemy? And people scratched their head, and they said, well, there's hope. We might have enemies in the future. <laughs> so I was wondering if world peace would spread around the planet like a virus, just like somebody opens a bottle and just world peace and nobody wants to kill each other anymore, then we would see headlines like this. World peace threatens local economy. <laughs> and uh, we were kind of proving, just in our own peaceful society, Eisenhower's warning in his final speech about the military industrial complex, about being addicted to an industry, and even though it's obsolete and it doesn't work and it has no role anymore, we want to continue and keep it going. There's another problem that we solved. Uh, this is a geothermal power station. Iceland became totally independent of uh, coal and oil for do domestic and house heating. All our energy around 1990 was clean, renewable, excellent. Just totally fulfilled. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> but the solution is a problem, because very skilled and talented people, they created the system. And what were they supposed to do, stranded on an island, where they didn't have anything to do anymore? So uh, this is kind of how they would have to have lived their life. This is what rivers we would have damaged uh, or, or harnessed for all our use. And then just all the rest would just be nature, something like this. But this was really uh, bad for our good engineers. And they were looking at these waterfalls that were just running for nothing. And they were calculating all the loss <laughs> every year of these falling waterfalls. And, uh, and they found hope. This is uh, an aluminum smelter. One of these uses energy like 1 million people. We're only 300,000 on an island. So they sent out these excellent brochures to these aluminum companies offering them endless power without damaging the environment. And uh, I calculated how much they were offering these companies. That was kind of everything that was left unharnessed on the island. So from that moment, but nothing happened for like 20 years, but suddenly the energy market pushed out the smelters from Europe and America. And three smelters were on the way to Iceland, which was almost like we, the population increased of th up to three million people in a span of, of like uh, six years. <clears throat> so we've been fighting for this area, the greatest nesting place for pink-footed geese in the world. We lost this area. We have been struggling to let people know that this area exists, and this one, and this one. And this one, we lost that waterfall over there. And you can see the people on the waterfall. And this waterfall was almost unknown in Iceland because an unspoiled nature is, almost, is also undiscovered by people. And this one, we lost this one. And we're struggling for the geothermal areas around Iceland now because of smelter that wants to be built on the southwest coast. So. Uh, also, we are addicted to Jamaica. So we were not, the goal was not to have solved the problem, to have harnessed energy, but to always be harnessing energy. And this goes to Jamaica, and they are moving the raw material from Jamaica to Iceland, the bauxite and the alumina. And they are addicted to be digging up Jamaica. And the most unpopular people in Jamaica are the people that want to stop. Eventually, they will finish the raw material. They will be forced to stop. They will have strip mined much of their most important areas, but they can't stop. In the USA, about one million tons of aluminum cans are thrown away unrecycled annually, 
that is four times more than a total commercial air fleet every single year. So I wonder, is that reality to produce energy to serve a person's primal need to throw away a can? Is that industry? Is that real? And if you look at all the indicators of the future of the planet, global warming, biodiversity, all of these things that we've been looking at in this uh, pop tech session here, the industry wants to go into the other direction. Only one million tons, you can see those 60 million tons up there, only one million of those tons would be enough to devastate most of Iceland's pristine nature and finish Jamaica in a span of about 20 years. So I was wondering about how rational we are as humans. Where does this come from? Where is this uh, need? Where is this addiction coming from? And I was looking at this. These are the Egyptian pyramids. And I was wondering, there must be something similar in that. These must have been humans, too, that made that. And I made this theory. I really bet that the, these three pyramids in Giza, they were not built with 500 years interval, I bet they were all built in one crazy boom. Because the theory is this, you cannot build one pyramid. If you have 40,000 people working on a pyramid for 40 years, that's the economy, that's what you do. That's your social status from the lowest worker to the highest assistant of the pharaoh. This is reality. This is economy. This is the supply system. This is the culture. So after 40 years of building a pyramid, the most obvious thing to do is to build another pyramid. And you need motivation and progress, so it's probably a bigger pyramid. And after you've been building a pyramid for 80 years, nobody asks a question. You know, we build pyramids. That's what everything is about. And even though the pharaoh had some slight willing to change and do something else, it's just not possible because if he stops, if he would tell everybody to go swimming in the Nile and play with their children and grow a garden, do something, mm -mm. that's unemployment, that's a crisis. We have to build another pyramid. So it's not until they have built the third pyramid that somebody scratches his head. And they like look at the pyramid and they're like, are we going to build four pyramids, and five, and six? Can this really go on? And then there's this rumor that comes out. Uh, did you know that in Greece, it's not all about building a grave for the pharaoh? There's even no pharaoh. There's some kind of democracy. And they just build these kind of holes. And they sit there, and they eat bread, and they're watching these tragedies. Really, uh, do they take the stones there? No, it's no stones. And then they pay the, like these strange guys just to walk around and think strange things. <laughs> and, uh, and they celebrate life. OK, but how do they, what do they do to the dead people? Well, they just put them in a hole. How innovative. And they find out that uh, a dead pharaoh in a, in, a, in a giant pyramid is just as dead as a dead person in a hole. <laughs> and they kind of move, lose their motivation. And, uh, and I looked into historical data, and this is actually true. The pyramids of Giza were built in a period of 120 years. And uh, I wonder quite a lot, can we break out of this cycle? Can we stop these damaging activities? And where are we in this pyramid building today? Because it seems like our great engineers have taken our bad habits and calculated how they can duplicate them in the emerging economies and even doubling or tripling the scale of destruction, just like we saw the future predictions of aluminum production. So I really wonder, is there no alternative is there any way that we can see creativity and see a role in life as multiple realities, as a choice? Do we always have to look at us as a product of a corporation, of a problem? Or can we look at ourselves as creative individuals that can choose and hopefully celebrate life instead of death? Thank you very much.
Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother.